And we've all got questions. How many of us in the last 24 hours have had that nagging question that you just had to Google the answer to? I was joking with somebody before. I was like, remember when I was little, we would just argue about things that didn't matter because there was no way to find the answer. Nowadays, we don't even have those arguments. We just find the answer and move on with our lives. If you looked at my search history recently, you would find a lot of Disney questions because my youngest daughter is in that season. Her, my, my wife, her mom, and me are not super Disney people. Somehow it has invaded the house despite our efforts. Those people are amazing at their marketing and they know what kids want. Some adults too, right? But she, you know, she has learned We have a Google Home on the counter. She's learned she can ask it questions. She's learned if we're not at home, she can ask us, and the phone can get answers to things. Things like, um, why is Sebastian and Ariel um, a crab or a lobster? I don't don't know the answer to that. I think we found out he was a a crab. Um, Things like, who is the father of Nala in Lion King? We've actually basically, Lion King 1, 2, 1 and a half, we basically found every family relation that exists in all of the lions that are in that movie over the last few months. How do you pronounce the name of Moana's dad? Because none of us knew how to do that. We read it in the book, but we didn't know how to pronounce it. Right? You know, the important stuff in life, we have Googled and we have got the answers to And whether we like it or not, our devices have become extensions of us and fuel all kinds of curiosity, questions that can be empty and questions that can be profound and have deep meaning for us, questions that are simply based on life around us, questions that are deeper as well, questions like, why does my life matter? Questions like, why do I have crippling imposter syndrome? Why does my job not feel so satisfying anymore? Questions like, how can I fix my marriage? Why does the world seem to be getting more chaotic? How can I battle depression? Is anyone else besides myself looking out for me and my family? And those kinds of questions aren't just the type that make us curious. They're the type that can keep us up at night. The type that we can avoid, that we can attack head on questions that are important, questions that while life is beautiful and full of promise and God has hope for us, we also live in a difficult world at times. And today we're beginning a seven-week series in conjunction with hundreds of other churches around the Bay Area called Explore God. And we're going to look at some of the big questions of life, some of these questions, exploring these we want to invite you, if you're new here with us, if you're new to faith, if you're exploring faith, we want to invite you that this is a safe place for you to ask your questions, explore faith, explore God, and we want to say to you, you're welcome here as you do that. This morning, we're going to kick it off with an important question. Does life have purpose? Does life have a purpose? Does my life matter? Does your life matter? I mean, it does. Well, we're going to get into that a little bit deeper here this morning. Does your life matter? That search for purpose is central, actually, to why we started this church. Some of you heard part of that story last week. We're here so that, to help people find their purpose because I found that while I had the head knowledge of God, I didn't quite know how to live out my purpose in my job and with my family and in my life, and I wanted to see more churches helping people figure out what that looked like. Not just, hey, come to church on Sunday, but what does it look like all week for you to have a purpose for your life? Because God has a meaning. You're here for a reason. You're in your workplace for a reason. You're in your family for a reason. You live where you live for a reason. God has purpose for you. And that search for purpose is not unique to us today. We're going to take a look at King Solomon, a very famous king in the history of not just the Bible, but the world, actually. And he was the kind of king, he lived thousands of years ago in Israel, and he was attributed to writing the book called Ecclesiastes that we're going to look at today. And it's a commentary on the meaning of life. And in this book, the speaker over and over again, 38 times, cries meaningless. He starts this way, everything is meaningless, says the teacher, completely meaningless. 
you're new with us, welcome to Tacoa Church. Glad you're here. We are an uplifting church. Now, we'll get there. We'll get there. But we got to acknowledge the real question, right? If we ignore the question, the, the hope is meaningless. The good news is meaningless if we don't acknowledge the reality of the question on the front end. And King Solomon realized there's so much in life that is just meaningless. And this word that was written here in the original Hebrew is a word that we translate as meaningless or vanity or vapor, something fleeting and temporary, something that as you try to grab a hold of it, it has no substance to it. So to help us this morning, I got a very fancy piece of equipment to help us understand this vapor thing, right? It's here and it's gone. Like it's here and it's gone. And that's what he is saying about so much of life. And we're going to look at some of the specific things that he talks about in this this morning. And he had depth to what he wanted to say, because this guy, it wasn't just a fun quote that, oh, that sounds good. He, he lived it. He had everything pretty much you could want besides living in the 21st century and not like before Christ, way long ago, before modern conveniences. But he had everything you could hope for pretty much in life. This guy was super rich. He had so much in his life. And as he unpacked, and we, as we unpack this, we see how much he had, yet he still said, you know what, it's just meaningless. So the first thing he chases is um, knowledge and wisdom in pursuit of purpose. And that, those are good things, but even that, he says, is not enough. He said, I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who are over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. Right? This is pretty relatable to us here in the Bay Area in our age of information. Um, we see a lot of things. I'm going to keep that up there for a second. Right? There's so much around us, so much that we know, so much that we can see, so much that we want to know, and that we idolize just knowing and being wise, being able to find the answers to things. And this guy was so wise that other kings, other rulers, other people from around the world were coming to him for answers to their problems. And we want to be wise, to be seen as a source of inspiration, right, even for others, and thankfully, we learn and we get wiser as we get older. At least most of us do as we get older. Because I don't want to relearn every time that stoves can be hot, like my kids are still trying to learn right now. There's so much. As kids have said, wisdom from some children this morning. Patrick, age 10, said, never trust a dog to watch your food. Michael, age 14, said, when your dad is mad and asks you, do I look stupid, don't answer him. And he said, never tell your mom her diet isn't working. <laughs> Susie, age nine, said, never hold a dustbuster and a cat at the same time. That does not work. That's not going to go well for you. Naomi said, if you want a kitten, start out by asking for a horse. That's probably pretty good if there's any kids listening to this. That might be good advice. And Lisa, age nine, she said, felt markers are not good to use as lipstick. And finally, Joel said, don't pick on your sister when she's holding a baseball bat. Right? And we, we, we look, wisdom is good. And we, I, we look up to those with wisdom, and that can be a good thing to learn from them. But, and somehow today in our name and age, right, and this is, some of this is a good thing, right, that we look up to people with wisdom, but even today, right, CEOs have become household names. That's why kids want to grow up to be an influencer, not just a movie star these days, to be able to influence other people's lives, and we look up to that, and we try to pursue that. We respect those who use their knowledge to, to help other people, to, and we think the more knowledge we have, we buy into this, the more knowledge we have, the more wisdom we have, the more meaning and purpose we can have in life. Even we you know, pursue crazy educations and go into so much debt because we think right, the more wise we are, the more that we can get out of this life. And there's some aspects of truth to it, but it's not enough on its own. Right? And being influencers can be good. We want to impart wisdom to other people. We want to help other people and lead them. But so many times we do that because we want people to remember our name. It's not about just helping them. It's about us being the wise one that they get to learn from. We want people to remember our name, to remember the name. Even the lead singer of Linkin Park got that. Of, he wrote a song called Remember the Name, and I 
was remembering that as I pulled this up last night. There's a few people. I, now I know who in the room. All right, see, I, I checked. That was a test to know who I want to hang out with after service this morning. Don't go listen to that song, though. I pulled it up last night from a decade ago, and I said, nope, this is not good to listen to anymore. But, right, people know all around us, people even know, right, that wisdom can be good. Solomon says, I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this thing, wisdom in itself, is striving after the wind. It's vapor. It's here and it's gone, even of itself. And it doesn't take long for us to live around Silicon Valley to realize that your head can be full when your heart can still be empty. Solomon's search for purpose would continue. He then sought accomplishments. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. And I guess if you can be great enough to plant parks for yourself, you have to make pools and rivers and water to water your parks and gardens and trees as well. On top of this list of accomplishments here, Solomon was also responsible for the building of the temple in Jerusalem, which was an ancient wonder of the world the remains of which are still in Jerusalem, of which I've been to and see. This guy had a list of accomplishments in his life. If you want to populate a LinkedIn profile, he can do it well. An accomplishment in the Bay Area is the air we breathe, right? Our culture is move fast, break things, make something people want, right? And we want our resumes to be shiny, our dreams and aspirations to be big, larger than life, and just to never stop moving forward. Contentment is not our strong suit here. We talked last week, right? Jerane got to share her story with us. A preschool teacher, not a tech executive, a preschool teacher. And I think that just shows us that from any aspect of life, not that the preschool teacher's down here and the tech executive's up here. That was not what I was trying to communicate with that. But let's go this way, from over here to over here and the spectrum in between, right? All of us are looking for purpose and that the culture of trying to make some accomplishments is in us. And even I talked about this last week of we're trying to be special, not just receive what God has for us. Do you enjoy life or are you just trying to refill the bank that is so empty because you've been hustling so much and you've been striving so much and you're trying to accomplish so much? So many of us, I think, right, we're getting that picture on Instagram of the food that we ate, and we're getting the TikTok of the hike that we're going on, just to, you know, and it's not actually enjoying those things. You know, we do a little bit, but we're so empty that they're, they're, they don't overcome how negative our bank is from all that we've been striving for in life, Right? And those are good things, and we should enjoy life, but so many of us are just so empty that that's not enough to fill it for us. And the scales remain firmly tipped to the side of debt, that we just are looking for more from life, and we're so tired and empty. And in the end, Solomon would say, accomplishments are meaningless. They just pass away from us. He would pursue pleasure as well. This is the next thing we're going to talk about. And Solomon, you're like, ah, that's what it's about, right? The good things in life, those enjoyable things. And he would pursue pleasure in his life, and he thought that's what it's going to be about. And a good illustration of this for our modern self of manufacturing and sustaining pleasure is Disneyland, right? I already brought that up earlier. Let's bring Disney back here. Love it or hate it? Most of us fall in one of those camps and not in the middle on Disneyland, um, right? My neighbor just got back. They took their youngest son, and he was, the dad was so excited. He said, I'm done. I took each kid one time, three kids. I've been three times. I'm done, and at least until grandkids, I don't have to go back. And others of us are like, I want to go every other weekend, even though I live up here in Northern California, right? People love this, but know this, right? The, the, the more you're there, that place, right, it is made for pleasure. Every aspect of it is made for, for pleasure. And they're not just employees, right? They have cast members because it doesn't matter if you're manning the churro stand or you're the janitor. You are a part of the experience for everybody that is there. Delicious food, amazing rides. They have an entire underground tunnel network so you don't even have to see them removing trash from the trash cans while you're there. Like, right, it, it is 
They've got it figured out. And their goal is to manufacture pleasure in kids and adults. But if you've ever spent an entire day there, like from open to close, and one time I got to go there like early entrance by an hour, and I was literally the special circumstances, last one to leave the park like an hour later. Tell you what, I was like over, it was great, and I was over that place. Like the next day, I was not, hey, can I get there early? Can I get in the door early? You know, right? The pleasure factor had just steadily gone down over the course of that time. It's the law of diminishing returns, depreciating returns. The longer you stay, the longer you enjoy something, the the more you are not going to get pleasure from it anymore. And Solomon said, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep it from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. He lived a Disneyland kind of life. Or if you're a different kind of person, a Las Vegas kind of life, right? Like that's the kind of life that he lived. He had it all. And he had women, he had possessions, he had whatever he wanted. And people would be envious of what he had. And he said, you know what? I got it all and it's, it's gone. It's gone. It's not here for very long. Meaningless. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, it was vanity and striving after the wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. And let's hope he picks it up from here, right? This guy is a little depressing right now. Yet we protest. Maybe Solomon just didn't do it right. If I could get more of what I want, I'd be satisfied. But the problem with pleasure is that it is never enough. God wants us to enjoy life, But if we are doing that with the wrong basis, it will never be enough enjoyment for us. The law of depreciating returns always applies to pleasure. C.S. Lewis describes this as an ever-increasing craving for an ever-decreasing pleasure. And in the end, it is all meaningless. Solomon said, I gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. Yet wealth, too, left him feeling like it was never enough. It was all fleeting for him. And I think many of us have become much more aware of the fleeting nature of wealth in the last few years, last few decades that we've lived through, right? Stock market's a little rocky, bank can collapse out of nowhere, apparently, even in the 21st century. Entire markets that seem to be promising are disappearing. People have made and lost tremendous wealth over the last few years, right? There's a new movie about, like, random people that made so much money from, like, GameStop stock while other people lost so much over it. And we know that wealth is itself is not enough to be our purpose. If it was, there would be a lot less depression here in Silicon Valley. There'd be a lot less anxiety here in Silicon Valley, wouldn't there? Suicide would be on the decline and not the rise here in this place. King Solomon knew of his own wealth that it would not satisfy him. And he would grab a hold of it and he realized, you know what, it's nothing. It's just here and gone. And it reminds me of something, a, a quote that I don't remember very many quotes. This quote I have never forgotten from Jim Carrey. He said, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so that they can see that it is not the answer, right? Because sometimes we think, well, but I'm different than them. Like, oh, but they they actually do, like, it is better for them than it is for me. And he's like, you know, I wish everybody could see that it's not, that they could have it so that they could realize, you know what, that's not the answer, and then they could find what the real answer is. And if it's the case and none of those things satisfy, we're still left with the gaping hole of purpose. Like, what does? Right? That's depressing, Pastor. You just told us all the things that don't. I got that. I'm here. I've been there. What does? What is my purpose? And this is Solomon's conclusion. The end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Solomon was convinced that the suffering, death, the difficulty of life made the pursuit of everything meaningless. 
And what he was trying to write and communicate to us was this. Fear God, keep his commandments. This is the one thing that isn't meaningless in life. It's not that wisdom and wealth and pleasure and accomplishments are bad in and of, in and of themselves. But instead, those things only have meaning when God is at the center of your life. And when God can become the center, this is the great thing, food becomes more enjoyable. Friends become better and more enjoyable. We go on the hike, we eat the food, we do the things, right? And this is important. I want to say this as a pastor because some of us maybe have been in churches where it's like you're supposed to like suffer in life and that's the goal. It's not the goal. God actually wants you to enjoy life. And the gospel and the Bible, the good news is about having joy in life and getting to enjoy. God created creation with good things in it for us to enjoy. He didn't just say, hey, you have to eat one thing every day and that's all you get to eat. He created flavor so that we could enjoy food. But in its place, with, him, with our purpose at the center, with God at the center, then those things actually become greater for us. Your hobbies, your friends, your family, with God at the center, those have more meaning. We spend most of our lives trying to pursue things that help us avoid pain and suffering, things like wealth and pleasure and wisdom. But the author of Ecclesiastes here is pointing out to us, when God is at the center, we have the possibility to live with purpose regardless of our circumstances. The brother of Jesus says this in the New Testament, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And right, that sounds great, and it can be hard to apply it to our lives. And while it might seem counterintuitive, how could suffering be good? And it's, I already said this, but it's not our goal to suffer. That's not the goal of our lives. But we know it will be a part of life because we live in a broken world. The fear of the Lord, what fearing God, what following Him, what that, that's what that means, trusting Him with our lives, what it does is it takes this suffering in our world and it flips it on our head, its head. And we see the challenges of life and say, you know what, sometimes in the biggest challenges I see God most clearly. Because when I feared God in the middle of it, I got to see God at work. Now, if we turn away from God in the middle of it, guess what? We don't see the work that he's doing. But some of the clearest times I've seen God in my life are some of the most difficult times in my life. Now, I don't want to go through more difficult times if I don't have to. Right? I'm, I'm trying to avoid those when I can. But I also recognize some of the blessing from those times is that my faith is stronger and that I've seen God more clearly and that I trust him more. And as a pastor that started a church right as COVID started, that was not my plan, that was God's plan, and we've gone through some difficult things, I will tell you that those difficult things have built my faith. And my faith is so much stronger because I've seen God provide time after time after time. Right, we got a, a new staff member partway into the journey, Pastor Tim, that was leading worship up here. And he was telling me one day we were trying to, I, I don't remember the exact circumstance. We were, I think we like needed a musician for something. We were like really desperate for something. And it was coming up. And I said, okay, Tim, have you asked everybody you know? Have you been praying about it? Are you doing everything in your power to find an answer? And he was like, yes, yes, yes. I was like, okay, well, I'm glad you feel this needs to be solved. And I'm glad you're doing everything you can. I'm not worried. If you did all of your part, God's going to do his part. I'll tell you what, five years ago, that was not the faith that I had. But now that's the faith I had because God has built it as I've learned to trust him more and more and more. And guess what? God provided our need and we were, it was fine. It was taken care of. We have to do our part, but if we have faith, God is going to do his part too. He is always working for us. And the stretching of life can actually bring satisfaction because we see God more clearly around us and working in us. We learn from it. And God himself gives us purpose as we center our lives on him. The book of Ecclesiastes begins with the speaker kind of having a chip on his shoulder, like affirming the power of God and his sovereignty in his life, but under the distinct impression that this all-powerful God maybe isn't that caring and isn't really there for him. But he ends with this. He ends by saying, hey, you know what? 
fearing God does is it builds a relationship with God. And that God wants to be our friend and have a relationship with us and with you and with me. It's not, he's not just a taskmaster assigning us things to do, telling us ways to live. But he actually wants a relationship with us. And the purpose of his book of wisdom is to point us to a relationship with God. C.S. Lewis says, I know now, Lord, why you utter no answer. You are yourself the answer. Before your face, questions die away. And similarly, when we acknowledge God as the source of our purpose and our life, suddenly he brings more satisfaction to everything else in life and we get to enjoy it even more. Food, relationships, life, home, it all becomes to be more as we keep God at the center. As we look around our world, we see so many people restless, looking for purpose in life. And that's, that's our mission as a church, to help them find it by connecting them to God. Literally, this is our mission as a church, to connect people to God because we believe that they will be able to find their purpose, they will be able to be equipped to live it out as they get connected to Him. Connecting people to God is the center of what we do as a church. It's the center of our faith, restoring relationship, building relationship with God. That is exactly why when we chase after all the things that Solomon chased after, there is still deep restlessness that eats inside of us because it's not enough to satisfy. The point of that feeling and that restlessness has always been to point us back to God. In a world of vapors, God is the one true solid around us, the one that we can truly hold on to as we sang about before the message here. So my challenge to you this morning, I have a couple is in light of all of this, I want to encourage you to do a few things. The first of these has to do with three things that we believe as a church, I believe as a pastor, and all sorts of churches, right? These three things, if you do these three things, I think you're going to be able to build a healthy faith, a healthy healthy community, a healthy life. Like, there's more, but like these three are the center. First of these is to join our gatherings. You're in one of them right now. Join them regularly. Second one is to jump into a group, a group of people that you can know more deeply, that you can live and spend some of your life with and grow with. Third is to build the house. We call it build the kingdom of God. We do that through giving. We do it through serving. We do it through serving the community, building the church. And I want to challenge you this morning. Some of you are even new here with us. Like, great job. You Step one, you're done. And you might not be ready to go all the way on all of those yet, and that's okay. But I want to encourage you to, this week, we're actually starting our groups, number two, right? And we say here, don't do life alone. And I want to invite you to jump into one of our groups. Most of them are eight weeks long, so it's like not a forever commitment, right? If you jump into it and you're like, this is not what I thought it was going to be, you are not, number one, you could not come back. But number two, even if you're like, I like to finish things kind of person, it's only eight weeks long. You can always do something different next semester. But I want to encourage you, honestly, this is the greatest thing you could do probably for your faith, is to grow deeper in your faith with a few other people around you. And when I, the people I see that are healthy in their faith, in their life, in their spirituality, are people that have invested in community and that have invested in God's church together. And I see it. When difficult times come, they've got people that just surround them. You know, I see other people and they're like, man, I need help. And, you know, we try to help where we can, but they've got nobody around them. And I see other people, man, they've been investing in community and they've been spending time and building relationships and difficult times come and they're like, I have so much help. I don't know what to do with it. So many people around me that, you know, we're having so much fun and doing so much together that it's just so good, these people. So I want to invite you to, you can check these out on the website. Um, Go to our homepage and just click on groups. It'll take you there. We've got all church prayer on Tuesdays. That's a great one. You do not have to come. We'd love for you to come every week. You don't have to come every week. If you join that group, we'll just let you know because sometimes the location changes slightly. It's in this region. Um, But that's a group you can come. You need extra prayer that week? Come. You want to help pray for other people? Come. You need a little worship? Come to that um, when you can. Wednesdays, we've got an Explore God group. 
Um, we are going to be going deeper on what we're talking about here on Sundays. If you're still exploring Christianity, if you're new to the faith, I want to encourage you, come to this group. It's a co-ed group. Um, we're going to just be going deeper on these topics that we're talking about here on Sunday, and it's a place for you to ask your questions. You still got more questions that I didn't answer up here? Great. Bring those. We're going to talk about those questions that you have. And then on Thursdays, we've got a marriage group, we've got a women's group, and we've got a young adults group that all everybody likes to meet on Thursdays, I guess. And so they're all happening on Thursdays as well. Jump into one of these groups. If one of those doesn't fit you and you're like, I would love to be in a group, but I'm struggling to find one, let me know. I might have some other solutions for you as well. Feel free to reach out to me as well. But, but jump into these. It's eight weeks long, and I believe that these have the potential to change the course of your year. Jump in. Prove me wrong if it won't, but I believe it really, really will. So on that level, jump into a group. On a personal level, if you're here today and you don't buy into all of this that I've been talking about, all this God stuff, this Christianity, or maybe you're new to faith, or maybe your faith is a little bit stale, the thing I want to encourage you to do is this challenge. And a, a challenge from a famous thinker called Pascal who said, you know, he, he grew up knowing about God but not following him. And then in a profound experience, he got to experience God, and then he had a change of heart for him. And that experience ignited his passion to help other people find their way back to God. And he began to challenge his fellow smart people to look to him, and he he challenged them this challenge to say, you know what, I like to experiment things, you like to experiment with things, here's the experiment. Make a bet that there is a God who loves you. Make that bet. If you are right, you have everything to gain, and if you are wrong, you have nothing to lose. Make a bet that God is real. And if you're still wrestling, that's okay, but bet on the fact that it is true. Because if you're right, you've got everything to gain. If you're wrong, you haven't really lost that much. If you're wrestling, said another way is, make room for God to speak into your life. And so this is my, my challenge for, for all of us. It doesn't matter if you even could have had a faith for a long time is ask God this question. God, if you're real, make yourself real to me. God, if you are real, make yourself real to me. Because we believe in a God that is real, that still works, that is active. Many of you got to experience him even last week. Maybe you experienced him this morning. I want to encourage you, make space for him to move in your life, but invite him. He moves when we invite. And so make space, invite him to move in your life life. God, if you're real, make yourself real to me. Let me invite the band back up here as I start to wrap up, right? There's a big difference than just believing in God and actually living it out as if it's true. And Jesus, in one of his most famous sermons, said, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? He is saying, don't chase after all this stuff that you think will fulfill you. Instead, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will will be added to you. What does Jesus say? Seek first his kingdom. Not our own, not all the things of this world that we could get for ourselves, things that we often lose sleep over trying to pursue. I'm guilty of it too. God is saying, trust him, trust that he's good, and watch your life radically transform. God, if you are real, make yourself real to me. This week, let's all ask God to make himself real to us, to give us a life of purpose, and purpose comes from seeking him and seeking his purpose for our lives. Would you bow your head? Would you pray with me right now that God would reveal himself to us? We're going to pray that he would give us purpose. God, we ask that you would reveal yourself to us As we enter in a minute into a time of worship, God, we pray that in that time, God, that you would reveal yourself. I pray, Lord, in a unique way to each and every one of us, however we need you, however you want to move in our lives. God, we want to know you. We want to have a faith that trusts in you. And God, we want to invite you saying, make yourself real to us. Move in our lives. I invite you to make that wager that God is real if you're on the fence. Say, you know what, I'm going to try it out and see. What if I were to live like he was real? What if I were to trust in him? 
I want to invite us here this morning, if you have not ever trusted Jesus, I'm going to invite you to do that in just a second. Jesus tells us that we've all messed up, we're all sinners, and our relationship with God is broken. And the way back to Him is through Jesus' death and resurrection. He took the death that we deserved, and He rose to new life. And He says, if you believe in Me, you will have eternal life. If you choose to follow Me, I will restore your relationship with God. It's not just about heaven, it's also about now. God wants to restore your relationship with Him. But we can't do it on our own. We need the work of Jesus to do it. And if you want to put your faith in Him, just echo these words in your heart with me. Jesus, I believe I've messed up and sinned. Jesus, I believe you died and rose again for me. Jesus, I commit to following after you. Amen. Amen. We're going to respond in worship this morning, and I want to give some space this morning. Sometimes we respond big in worship. Sometimes we respond to just make some space for God. So I'm going to make some space for us. Our worship team is going to help make some space for us right now. And I want to invite you, ask that question. God, if you're real, will you make yourself real to me? And give some space for him to answer. Listen for a second. Open your mind, your heart for a second to just let God speak to you. During this time, too, our team is going to pass around communion. Um, if you are a follower of Jesus, you're welcome to take communion with us. I'm going to invite you to hold on to it. We're going to take it together in a minute. You can also use this time to just prepare your heart to um, meet with God in communion. But take this time. The team's going to lead us. And then just ask that question. God, if you're real, would you make yourself real to me? And I believe he's going to speak to you this morning.